Welcome to the Radiant Mission Podcast. We are on a mission to encourage and inspire others as they navigate through this life and in their relationship with Christ. We are a faith-based podcast, so approach issues from a biblical perspective. If you've been listening along, we hope that you've enjoyed our series on spiritual warfare. Today, we'll be touching on the spiritual realm just a bit. But before we jump in, I'd like to in- introduce to you my very special, very, very special guest. Not only is he, yes, he, the first guest on the Radiant Mission podcast and also happens to be a man, <laughs> he is also my husband. Yay. <laughs> That's right. He's a man of many names. He usually goes by Mike. He also goes by Mikey with the glasses. And my personal favorite is either Daddy Pig, which is what our daughter calls him because she's a Peppa Pig fan, or I like Midwife Mike. (laughs) So he earned that name when he caught our son during our recent home birth. Welcome, my love. Thank you so much. Excited (laughs) to be here. Not only are you the first guest, but you're also a man, which Rachel said, we're going to allow men on here, and here you are. (laughs) Here I am. I wish I brought my glasses, though, because that would have been good. I know. You don't have your glasses. Make sure that you stay close to the mic, my podcasting co-host today. (laughs) It's a little different because we're actually together, so if you want to follow along on video, you can check it out on YouTube and watch us doing this interview together. And that's why we're sharing a mic. <laughs> I'll share the mic with you. That's fine. You share the mic with me. You got to yeah. stay close. I know I smell yeah. like coffee, but you know, you made it for me that's for right. this I'm sure episode. I do too. <laughs> it's all good. Now, Mike and I have been together for almost nine years now. It's crazy. And we've been married for about four and a half years. We have two beautiful little babies together, which you're about to hear more about those two. And for those of you that are wondering how we met, we met on the sidewalk in New York City. Good old New York City. How about that? <laughs> uh, it really was a love at first sight situation and story. Our eyes met and the rest is history. And we have never had a problem ever since. <laughs> I'm not sure that's true. <laughs> right? <laughs> not one problem. It's just been smooth sailing. No, definitely we've had some highs and lows and ups and downs and that is one of the reasons why it's on our heart to share our story with you we're hoping that it helps others but before we really dive in i would love for mike to share a little bit for you to share a little bit more about your background your testimony and you know how your walk with the lord yeah so i grew up catholic um And for the time that we've been together, I think you've been kind of showing me the way um, in Christian church. And, you know, you said this in the intro, um, being biblical, you know, that's something that I never really thought about that I didn't really know about. And so that's really what I've been learning really over the past, you know, few months, few years. Um, You know, the big move that we took to Tennessee was a time where I really focused on the Lord and like was looking for his guidance. And I feel like now we're in this place where we got through that kind of trial Mm. and we've got some time to really sit back and think in a, in a comfortable time, you know, where does God play a role in our day to day, you Mm. know, and, and raising our kids and working and just kind of living our regular life. Um, and that that biblical, I think is the key word, you know, that's not something that I ever really knew about. Okay. So just kind of your, your shift from kind of knowing about God, you knew the story of Jesus, you knew some of the stories in the Bible, but walking with him in the word and learning about it is something that's been newer for you over the last few years to summarize. Yeah. And you know, it's interesting. Like we had a conversation in the car a couple of days ago about how you're, feeling like your word is like that you're a believer, you know, to Mm -hmm. put that stamp on it. And I was usually always a believer. There was a short time, um, probably around college age that I wasn't really sure. 
and maybe we can get into that. We'll see where we go. <laughs> um, but yeah, that's that's exactly it. Like sure. knowing that there's always knew that there was more, and now finally, like really trying to discover mm. and see where he leads us. Good deal. For a little bit of context, what Mike was referring to is we were talking about all the different denominations and how, you know, there's Catholicism and there are Protestants and within Protestantism, there are all kinds of shapes and sizes, <laughs> right? Baptists and Presbyterian, non-denominational, etc. And I had made a comment that I don't really identify with any denomination. I'm a believer. That is what That is what my focus is on is not on fitting in with a denomination, but in my personal walk with the Lord. And so just for a little bit of background there. Um, but thank you for your background and for sharing your heart with this podcast today. I know it's a little nerve wracking for you in some ways, probably, because it's very different. This whole situation is a little bit different and new for for you. <laughs> it's definitely different. You know, I'm a tend to be kind of introverted like i like to be social i like to hang out with people and have fun um, but i'm a financial analyst i'm a data guy and like you know talking and having feelings and all that kind of stuff is a little new for me so i'll try to you know wear my heart on my sleeve today having feelings is new having feelings having a powwow you know that's not really my style but you know i'm gonna do my best to to share and and kind of you know i'm excited to participate in this with you you know this is kind of your you. baby and I'm, I'm really excited that you're bringing me in Thank you. I I appreciate that. And I'm excited to talk through this. It is definitely a journey that we have both been on together. It's been a long but short nine years, I'd say. And our topic today is birth. And as we begin sharing some of our testimony, I do want to premise this conversation by saying that this episode is for everyone, really everyone, that it's not just for women. I would highly encourage you to share this episode with your husband if you're married or your future husband if you're soon to be married. If you're planning on having a baby or are pregnant, this is definitely for you. If you know someone who's pregnant or who's trying to conceive, definitely share this with them. And if you're not yet in that season of life with children, it's still for you because there are going to be lessons we're going to talk about that we hope transcend and, and stick with you as you move forward into that season. And if you are out of the season of children, this is still for you too, because we're going to talk about some medical stuff that might get your wheels turning a little bit. It may not exactly have to do with birth for you, but it might be something else that might get you thinking about your current situation. So there are some dots that we were able to connect in this process and during our experience that really transcend beyond the childbearing years and childbearing season, I would say. So who knows? You know, you might even find your own story in it. I know many women have experienced birth trauma themselves and may not have processed that yet. And maybe this can be a doorway to begin doing that. I hope most of all that this episode brings you peace and healing I've discovered that there's a lot of trauma around birth, which I did not know before I had my first birth. I didn't know that was a thing. You know, it's not really talked about in a way that makes it clear uh, that it is similar to PTSD, that it is a trauma that you really have to to work through. So it's not often talked, talked about or processed the right way. And a lot of times women, they tuck their stories away, they hide it under a basket, <laughs> And they don't uncover it. And it's really in the forgiveness and in the resolution that we are finally able to find peace. So if that sounds like you, I hope that this helps you to start seeking some peace as well. And lastly, I, I also want to premise this by saying I am pretty forward with how I talk about birth and my own birth experiences. So if you're not in a place to hear about childbirth or birth trauma or medical complications... <laughs> then please be aware that this is my trigger warning to you. Maybe you might not be ready to listen to what we're going to talk about. Let's let's get started. We're going to jump into it. Yeah, let me <laughs> give a quick premise for any man that might be listening to this. Mm. Um, I really want to say that you may think, and, and I probably did think this in the beginning, that you know birth and childbirth and pregnancy is all about the woman, but 
we have to participate too. You know, we were there in the beginning, probably. <laughs> we had something to do with it. Likely. And, you know, your mama bear needs your support. You know, mm -hmm. it's really important to participate and to be there to help her emotionally, physically. You know, there's there's so much that we need to play a role in too. Mm -hmm. And we yeah. could make the experience go so much better if we do that, you know? Definitely. And that was one of the lessons that you and I learned together, I think, in our first birth with our daughter. And you definitely learned the lesson the first time. And I learned my lessons the first time. And it goes to speak for what happened when we had Ben, our second child, our son. And it was totally different. That's something else I want to say. And we mentioned this, Rachel and I, I believe last time or in a previous episode that even if you have a bad experience, that doesn't mean that has to be your new, ex your next experience. Your every birth is a new birth. And if you had a bad time, you can turn that around and have a great time the next time. So that's something that, that we really want to throw out there. But thank you for saying that for other dads. And something else that I, I want to say you really helped me tremendously too after birth. There is actually a book called The First 40 Days that talks about how for 40 days after you have a baby, and I think there, believe there is actually a biblical precedence for this. It's really about the mom bonding with the new baby and healing and focusing on staying still and not moving and, and moving on with life. And I know that most women will say, well, I can't do that. I got to go back to work. I got all these other kids. I have to do all these things. But in doing that, you are so going to prepare yourself for the future. So just throwing that one out there. When you have a partner, when your husband is there to help make that a reality, that makes the biggest difference. And that made a huge difference for me. So thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> I did it for 41 days. <laughs> <laughs> no, you did. <laughs> I think it was more like... 30 days. No, 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 no. It never stopped. It never stopped, oh, right? Oh, okay, okay. Oh, come on. You know you love my homemade ice cream, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah, unfortunately, I can't eat that homemade ice cream right now. Mike and I are doing 75 hard right now. Um, we're almost done. Almost done. I've we're got, almost there. I think I have eight days left. Mm, you're so close. So I'm getting very close. But, you know, I really did want ice cream, you know, halfway through. But now I'm kind of over it, I think. I don't know. I'll probably maybe... You'll be singing a different tune when you're done. <laughs> In eight days, we'll see what happens. Yeah. Mike really does make great homemade ice cream, though. And pancakes. Anyway, enough about Mike's cooking. <laughs> <laughs> our journey into parenthood was really right in the middle of our own medical awakening for both of us. We've always been pretty close to on the same page. When it comes to medical stuff, you know, maybe you even a little bit further than me <laughs> for some things... In terms of being leery of medical procedures and whatnot and going to the doctor and all that good stuff. I had just come off of the second IUD that caused some major issues for me. I believe we may have talked a little bit about this in a previous episode, but I basically had a copper IUD and developed a copper toxicity to it that caused severe anxiety it really felt like I was having heart palpitations. Uh, Rachel introduced me to the book called Taking Charge of Your Fertility. And I'll link that in the show notes as well. And I learned so much about our bodies as women and how we are kind of sold a lot of these devices, these birth control type of situations without really understanding how it could potentially impact us in other ways. So that was kind of one of the things that I was going through at the time. And Mike actually went to the OB with me when I had that IUD removed because it was a male OB and I didn't, I felt kind of weird about that. And I wanted to make sure I had my support system with me. And I remember the doctor asking us what we were going to do for birth control. And I told him that I'd read Taking Charge of Your Fertility and we were going to practice fertility awareness method, which is also called FAM, by the way. And the doctor goes, you know what I call, <laughs> you know what I call that method? And he paused and he was like, parents. <laughs> and he was 100% right. Uh, no, don't say that. It's <laughs> he a was though. It's, it's a great method for women that want to get off of hormonal birth control or any form of medical birth control 
It's basically teaching you how your cycle works and how to chart your own cycle because there is this assumption that all of us are exactly the same and that is a very false, very, very false um, narrative. We are all different. And when you start charting yourself, you will learn how you function. So we actually did practice using FAM to not have a baby. And then we used it to have a baby. <laughs> so we actually found out a week before, about a week, a couple of days before our one year wedding anniversary that we were expecting our first daughter, Brooke. And it was a very exciting time. I, I liked being pregnant, but I also had a hard time too. I had a lot of morning sickness, which I have since learned is a mineral deficiency. It's caused by us not having the proper nutrients. And so we get sick from it. I had the same thing happen in my second second pregnancy and that's kind of how I learned this, right? We found a great doctor that was more of a natural type of doctor and he prescribed B vitamins. I was also taking beef liver capsules. Guys, this is the best stuff. <laughs> so, uh I'll link to whatever I uh, whatever I took that you can get easily. The other stuff is a brand that is sold at our um supplements that are sold at our doctor, so I don't think I can do that, but anyhow, it helped out a lot. So I, I did have some morning sickness, but otherwise things were great. Loved our, I, I say loved, but you know, it was better than past. We had good doctors in the beginning when we were in Connecticut. The two guys at that one practice were really funny. Long Island guys. Hey, there's a lot of language in the office. How you doing? We're in New York. <laughs> that was great. They were hysterical. There was this one lady that was so nice. One of the female doctors so it was, overall, it was a pretty good start when we were pregnant. Then we moved to Tennessee and things kind of changed. I was fairly late in my pregnancy. I should have done the math. I was on the Healing Birth podcast recently. So definitely check that out if you want to hear kind of the birth, birth version of this story and not the God version of this story, although I do talk about spiritual warfare. Um... So we moved here and she was due on January 1st and we moved in September. So I was, you know, three months shy of having a baby and had to find a new practitioner, which at the time I didn't really even know. I, I didn't know what I know now about birth. And back then I thought, you know, you go to somebody and you're stuck with them and you can't move and you can't change and you can't make decisions again. You have to just go with what you got. It's a very scary feeling you feel, I felt anyway, like I was at the mercy of doctors and that I needed to stick with them and be dependent on them. And so I went to somebody and, you know, even though I didn't get the holly jollies <laughs> from her, I kept going. The nurse was pretty nice. She was chatty and... You really love the nurse. Yeah, the nurse, the nurse was, was your fun. Favorite part. She that was. kept you coming back. She was the one that kept me coming back yep. for sure. Yep. Because I would ask the doctor questions and she wouldn't give me very detailed answers. She wasn't she really She was robotic. To she be was honest. robotic. Yeah. She wasn't teaching me anything and I really wanted to learn. Now my mom has four children. She had all of them naturally. She had two hospital births that were very rough on her for a variety of reasons and it was because they were medicalized and, you know, they pushed Pitocin and inductions and all these things. And so when she went to have my sister and I, she had me in a birthing center and then Rachel. So I kind of had this in the back of my mind going into Brooke that it was a pretty painful experience. It can be. And, you know, all these other birth stories and things like that. And most of, we didn't go to a childbirth education class together because, we moved here so late that we should have, but we didn't go. We watched a YouTuber too. We, yeah, we were watching YouTube yeah. videos. We thought that that was enough that was preparation. Great. We definitely were going to be ready for that. <laughs> <laughs> it was like a 20-minute YouTube video. So it was a long YouTube video, you know? For the record, Rachel did tell us that we needed to go to a class. And she did tell us we needed to get our act together. So sorry, Rachel. Rachel's told listen. us a lot of things that have been true. <laughs> they they really, a lot of things turn out to be true from Rachel. It is true. Rachel knows what's up. She does. So She's good. Listen to Rachel. 
<laughs> because she was she's right. She's very wise. She's a very wise woman. So, yeah, that that is how things went. And then when I was 28 weeks, I got a shot that they call Rogam. And that really changed things. I did not know at the time it was from this injection. I didn't know until I had the second dose after my daughter was born. Our daughter was born. Ours. Also Ours, mine. Also yours. Also mine. You were there. Um, <laughs> <laughs> after the second dose, I had an anaphylactic reaction. And that's what made me think back to this. I had developed severe itching in my pregnancy. I thought I was going to rip my skin off. And you did for a little I while. I really did. You were really... It was really crazy to watch you go through that um you were trying everything topical and you literally were like scratching your chest off it was i remember you in the shower just so uncomfortable and you got all kinds of crazy like smelly soaps (laughs) smelly soaps yeah like the par the tar (laughs) soap right well to be a little bit more specific here what it felt like was i had little bugs it felt like almost I thought I had scabies for a minute, but I didn't. Um, I suspected maybe it was pups, but my doctor tested my bile and said it's not. That's not what it is. And in her very helpful advice, she said take an oatmeal bath. I'm like, come on. You don't think I I already... I thought that would have worked well. (laughs) You don't think I already tried that? And clearly it was coming from the inside of my body. It wasn't coming... It wasn't something on my skin. It wasn't scabies. So I started doing my own research, man. And this is what I'm talking about with this topic is not just about birth. This is about anything that you're going through medically. There are multiple facets to this. Obviously, we need to first seek the Lord, seek his guidance, seek that and ask him to guide us to the right resources, the right people, the right methods for healing. And then also to learn about his creation, to learn about how he made our bodies And this was definitely a test in that because it set me down this road. All right, if I have a problem with itching, it's likely related to an issue. I need to be able to process this problem through my liver. That was when I came across some information about dandelion root and how it cleans your liver. So I took high doses of dandelion dandelion root as a capsule I would drink a cup of tea at night before bed. And then I also was drinking a lot of fruits and vegetables that were obviously blended up because, you know, that's how you drink fruits and vegetables. <laughs> it's the only way you can it's drink the only them. Way you can or drink else them. you'd be eating them. <laughs> I was trying to detox. I was trying to clean my system. I avoided processed foods. I was trying to, you know, just get get things squeaky, clean the inside out, right? And then he wasn't kidding. Topically, I was using something called Grandpa's Pine Tar Soap. And it does smell like it sounds. It was very stinky. (laughs) (laughs) And I had read, somebody said that if you have itching from pups to take super hot shower. So I would take this hot shower. I would put this pine tar soap. I'd let it sit on my skin before I'd wash it off. I was taking three, four showers a day doing this. That's how bad it was, you guys. Not a joke. And then I was making my own concoction. I had coconut oil with some tea tree oil in it, peppermint and lavender to soothe, which made me feel so much better. But then poor Rosie, our dog, she would lick me when I had this stuff on. And I didn't know until she was sick. Peppermint is extremely toxic to dogs. She was really sick too. That was a problem. She was not doing good. That so then we problem. had to take her to the vet for that. And then I couldn't. Yeah, anyway, so do not let your dogs have peppermint. No peppermint. So if you um, do use something like this, make sure you don't have dogs that lick or let them lick or don't use it. So this was a big learning experience going through this. And at the time, I didn't know it was from this injection. Now, fast forward to we get towards the end. Our daughter was due I'm using the word do, but, you know, we don't use do anymore. That was her guest date. It was her guest date. (laughs) We have some different language, but January 1st, New Year's Day. And as the time approached, I got really, really ready for her to be born. Your parents were in town. And you're... By ready, she means she was going absolutely nuts (laughs) until the baby would come out. I was. She could not wait any longer. 
She did every old wives' tale. Being to a try first to get time mom out. is hard. Be ha, your first time. If you haven't had a baby yet and you're going through this now, I'm sure you know what I'm talking about. The first time was very nerve wracking for me. I was just ready to meet her by the end. I just was ready. I was like, "Come on, girl, let's go." And I, I was, I was doing weird old wives' tales too. I ate eggplant parmesan and. I don't know. You got all kinds of crazy massages. Oh yeah, I got a pedicure. I got a massage. Whole. You were eating so many <laughs> pineapples. Um, I can't even imagine what else you were doing. But you know, I just felt like it's already been nine months. Can you wait the two weeks to just let this baby come out when she's ready? This is very. But you couldn't. Very you couldn't. easy for someone who's not pregnant to say it was completely easy <laughs> it was it's beyond easy for me to say but this is a good lesson this is a great lesson because i was like that my first time and i was not like that my second time this once i learned that you the baby's gonna come when the baby's gonna come and no amount of stress over it no amount of doing the old wives tales even if the baby is not ready the baby is not ready And you could potentially put yourself into a situation by forcing the situation. If you force your hand in the Lord's work, then you might have to pay a price for that. And that is what happened to me because I was trying all of these things. And I did do something that did end up making me have contractions. I used my pump and it did kick off contractions for me. And unfortunately... I started the process off with something that is considered to be natural, but is kicking off. There is no natural induction. It's a induction. machine. It's not natural. There's so. no natural, even if you weren't using a machine to do that, I'm saying. It's kicking off labor yourself is not natural because the baby didn't make the decision to, you know, your body and everything is not there. So I just want to say that. So there we go. I was in labor. It was weird. I didn't know I was in labor at first. I just started having cramps after using my pump. I went upstairs, took a bath, and there for a little while. And I realized that my cramps were coming on and off, which doesn't usually happen when you have cramps, you know? (laughs) It may not be a cramp. (laughs) may not be a cramp. So I started timing, and it was contraction. So then I called Mike. We have a two-story house, so I called him on the phone. You know, that's what we do. And he came up, and he started timing me. And he's like, yeah, I think, I think uh, this is labor. Now, I didn't talk about the prodromal labor. A couple of days before this, we thought that I was in labor. We were watching, we were at the movies. We were watching Star Wars. And I was getting contractions coming on and off. And the guy that was sitting next to me, that poor man. <laughs> <laughs> I thought he was going to have a heart attack because he thought I was in labor. And Mike was getting so excited. He's like... Just ear to ear smiling like yeah it's time and i'm like why are you smiling <laughs> <laughs> but it wasn't we went to the hospital and they sent us home they said not yet so now because we it's so funny i said this to diana when i was telling her this story i felt like we were teenagers or something i felt like such a noob when that right? happened when they sent us home i mean i remember sitting in the room <laughs> and everyone's kind of just checking you out and like not really saying anything but i could tell how much calmer you got like you were definitely contracting more in the movie and eventually i was like listen we've got to go like if you feel like you're getting contractions it's time to go and we stood right outside the theater and you started to like double over and i was like oh come on like you're ready you're contracting it's ready to go (laughs) and then when we got there i could tell that it just like really calmed down for you Mm. And I was like, man, I hope she's in labor. We're going to look so bad if, she, if we showed up. Like, And it's too early. And, and sure enough, that's exactly what happened. What was good, though, for some reason, we didn't get billed like a full amount for the hospital visit. <laughs> oh, that's visit. what was good. But... So that was good. That was good for me, at least. Oh, my gosh. I would have felt really bad if we got billed twice that we showed up at the hospital early and then got like a double billing. This is the financial guy speaking. Yeah, I'm an accountant. What do you mean? <laughs> So we really did feel, well, what I was going to say is what made me feel even more like a teenager was the second time that this happened. And I was like, I'm going to call them. And I, you called them or I I called them, you called them. them. And we told them how far we were apart and we're like, do we need to come in? 
And they're like, yeah, it sounds, it sounds like it. So come on in. Thinking back on that and how different our experience was the second time, doesn't it make you, it makes you feel like, you know, I'm in my thirties and I'm over here not knowing what's going on, but that goes, that is just an example that I want to throw out there of an encouragement about birth to really learn about it before you're in your birthing time because I don't want you to have to go through feeling like that too where you don't know what your body is I mean I don't know how to say it you want to learn as much as you can but here's the thing you'll never really know until you go through it like there's certain things that you could only know after going through it Hmm. that experience for me calling the hospital Mm -hmm. What that really says to me was not just like feeling like a teenager or young or naive. That is a testament to me of how dependent we were yes. on the system. It's a and better not, way of like, it. Not yeah. just knowing for ourselves like what we were supposed to do, mm-hmm. what you were going through, what mm-hmm. to expect. Mm-hmm. Is that we immediately like we didn't even go to the hospital without calling like we just had no idea what to do yeah that's what that's really what it that means that's me. a much better way of explaining it that it was us just being disconnected from the experience and depending too much on medical care providers and during that time and so that is some of what we really want to talk about with this experience is we were trying to do it by ourselves first time we were just us and doctors and that's how we were going to do it you know we weren't we weren't deep diving into our the body what this body was this my body meaning the female body that god created and how it works and tapping into the lord for guidance and for him to him for peace you know as soon as i was in labor i just started freaking out and i was panicking and oh my gosh this is so painful you know, I was thinking about it from what I saw in the movies and what I heard from the stories that I had been told was what I'm feeling is painful. When, and I, again, I said this to Diana, pain is relative. Or actually, I think I said this to Rachel. You know, uh, what you're going through during labor and what you go through after birth trauma and during a C-section, both of those are painful. The difference is with a C-section, you have to deal with that situation for potentially for me it was a year after my daughter was born so would i rather deal with the quote physical pain of labor for however long that is or from the traumatic ramifications of the birth trauma that i experienced because of agreeing to you know the cascade of interventions so it's it's a very interesting dynamic and you know, I, I want to jump into that a little bit more, but I also just want to talk too about preparing spiritual, preparing spiritually and mentally for birth, because this was something that I did not do. I thought I was going to wing it. And I can't even tell you how many women I see out there that say the same thing. No, I'm just going to wing it. It'll be fine. I'm just going to wing it. Now, I did have a birth plan, so it's not like I didn't prepare ahead of time. It's not like I didn't say, I do want to do these things, I don't want to do these things. But I did not prepare spiritually. I did not ask the Lord to guide me or get me through anything. And I didn't prepare mentally either. And because of that, when I was in my birthing time, we called. They said, come on in. We were going to the car. I stepped on the first step and my water partially broke. So I knew I was in labor. We get to the hospital. They hook you up all to all the machines and everything. And they checked me for dilation, which I, again, I don't, didn't know then what I know now. So I got checked back then. And they said, you're about a one and a half. (laughs) (laughs) And I. Which means you're nowhere. (laughs) Basically lost my mind yeah. because I had been a two previously. Yeah. And so for them to tell me I was a one and a half, I just started freaking out. I, you know, I'm like, I can't do this. I, this is already too hard. I can't do it. Again, knowing what I know now, if I had stayed home, I have no doubt that she would have come pretty quickly after that. You she know, she was coming. She was coming. The, that experience. So like thinking about that moment when you did start to freak out, 
that brings me to my next time of being at the hospital Mm -hmm. and you started acting like that i really kind of took a step back i was like good thing we're at the hospital like let them handle it they deal with this all the time and that was a moment of that's the difference between the first and the second yeah. was that we were doing it together mm-hmm. that I knew I needed to be there for you. There was no one else. Mm-hmm. And like, that's if I'm going to speak to men about this birthing time, like this miraculous time that happens, it's that you are the closest one to mama bear. Like you, it's you, <laughs> you know, like the, the medical help, if you choose to be at the hospital, you know, there's lots of things and there's lots of people that have a role but as a support system, there is no one who could do more than you. Mm-hmm. It's there true. There is no one who could do more than you. It's true. So I've seen a lot of things on social media about kind of labor nurses and stuff. And they have all these different stories about the husbands or dads during mom's labor. Where they'll be like, oh, he was playing video games. Mm. Or he was eating. Or he was taking a nap. Or he, they basically had this whole thing about all the things that men do when their wives are in labor. And so I really hope that the, if there are men listening or women that are listening that want to share this with their husbands, hear you when you're saying you can't be on your phone. You can't be playing video games. First of all, if you bring your Xbox to the delivery room, <laughs> there are problems that going on. <laughs> you know, you've got to really be present and help her get through it. Because I'll tell you. If you really want your wife to have a quick, miraculous birthing time, you being present with her is going to help accomplish that. Mm. You know, I had three hours of labor with Brooke before three hours of pushing and ended up in a C-section for five hours. I mean, we're talking a long time here. Uh, And now let's compare that to second time around when I had Ben at home. It was three hours and 17 minutes from my first birthing wave until he came out. And that is a testament to, first of all, the Lord and him guiding us through that experience. But you were completely present with me. You were there during that time. We were working together as a team. So work together wherever it is that you decide to give birth. You know, make sure that you're a team together. Yeah, it was us doing that. Definitely. It was us. And, you know, I think there's two more things. The first is that, first of all, you don't want to annoy Mama Bear during her birth. So if you're like <laughs> fooling around on your phone and like distracted, <laughs> you're just going to annoy her and you want her to be happy, comfortable, relaxed. The other thing is scientific, is chemical. Mm-hmm. You need certain chemicals you know, the, the mother needs certain chemicals and hormones to get through this time. The most important one being oxytocin. Yes. And yes. so you, any screen, any, even a TV, um, any screen will reduce the oxytocin mm-hmm. and things that will increase it are the intimacy, hugging, kissing, mm-hmm. You know, so those are the things that you want to do. You want to be present with each other. You know, you were hugging on Brooke and like, you were, yeah, the second time. Like, so we knew that that was something that we knew only after the fact. Exactly. And we're still kind of sharing the first story, but I like that we're also talking about what we learned while, as we're going through this. So I definitely recommend Ina May Gaskin's Guide to Childbirth. I will link it in the show notes. It taught us so much about that mental side of things and what he's talking about with the chemicals that happen during birth, the natural oxytocin. When they give you a shot of Pitocin in the hospital, they're giving you synthetic oxytocin. Mm -hmm. It is doing what your body does naturally. And unfortunately, because it's a chemical, it is too strong for most people most people's bodies to tolerate which is why you end up having such severe contractions that you cannot even handle it so i urge you if you're preparing for this you know someone preparing for this please consider what we're talking about with pitocin and you know pushing and put pushing pitocin out of your mind and instead of thinking about what can i do to produce oxytocin you want to create an environment during birth 
that's going to allow oxytocin to flow. So as he mentioned, the second time, you know, we didn't go to the hospital, we stayed home. And as soon as those waves started happening, I grabbed our daughter and I was hugging on her and kissing her and she was hugging me. It was such a sweet moment, such a sweet time. And I also, I also was just really living in that moment because I knew I was about to be a mom of two. You know, this was my first, this was my first baby and now I was going to have a second baby. And so this was my last moments to have with just her by herself. And so getting the, that embrace and, you know, Ina May in her book, she even recommends that moms and dads kiss or make out even during. Ooh. <laughs> Ooh. <laughs> I'm sure the dads will like to hear that. <laughs> during your birthing waves, because again, it gets that oxytocin flowing and moving and keeping things along. Another thing, another chemical that's important to produce is actually melatonin. And that's why a lot of women go into birth at night. I was shocked my second time I went into labor in the middle of the day. I thought it would be at night. And so that's why they say, keep the lights low, keep the room quiet, peaceful. And it's kind of honestly the opposite of a hospital room, the beeping and the lights and everything. So if you are going to go into a hospital setting, Plan ahead and do everything that you can to make it a dark, peaceful, quiet space for for you. But let's kind of keep going through this birth a little bit. I also want to just share a couple of a couple of verses for you as you prepare spiritually. And the biggest being Proverbs 3 verses 5 through 6, which is trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not onto your own understanding in all your ways acknowledge him and he will make your paths straight that one is so important to remember during this you know we went into this on our own understanding we didn't ask for guidance we thought we could just handle it and let's talk about what happened Mm. (laughs) here we go here we go here we go so, that is what we did, though. You know, I, I think it is important to acknowledge that. We yeah. kind of just dove in. And, you know, I remember telling people, they were like, what's your birth plan? And I was like, I wish that we could just have this baby in the woods. Like, I think that we should just have this the baby first in the woods. The first time? The first time, yeah. Okay. And I just wish that we did that. Because then we would have <laughs> been more, like, on our own. Well, that's what I said the second time. That's interesting. I uh, definitely, yeah, I'm with you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Unfortunately, so we were at the hospital, you know, I got psyched out by this whole dilation thing and I quit on myself. Basically, I said, give me the epidural, give me the epidural. And so they gave me the epidural and interestingly, they kind of rushed the epidural. And I said, I said, I said it was because I was so unpleasant. (laughs) <laughs> that's a nice way to say it that's a nice way to say it i was it. so unpleasant they bumped me to the front of the line they gave me the epidural, and then i felt great because i felt nothing mm-hmm. which is actually awful mm-hmm. when i reflect back on it because i totally disconnected myself from the experience mm-hmm. i was totally my mind and my body were no longer communicating with each other because if you're not feeling any pain because you're blocking it you're your senses are blocking that. How is your body going to know what to do? You know, it, you were it, calm though. Well, uh, <laughs> you were very calm. That's true. We watched a movie. We watched Big Daddy. We were laughing. You know, we kind of that's what they had on the hospital TV. Mm-hmm. And things progressed, and then they came in and they checked me again. Now I don't. I should probably say this now. This whole dilation thing. This was something else I learned after having my daughter, our daughter. I keep saying my. Sorry, honey. She's also mine. <laughs> after going through this is you can actually reverse dilate. I don't know if you know that, but you can dilate to an 8 or a 10 and reverse to an 8 or a 6 or a 2 or a 5. Dilation is not necessarily a linear thing that sticks it is all about those chemicals that we were talking about before and it is also about staying comfortable 
and it's about the environment and your body just moving forward. There, in, in Ana May's book, she gives some examples of times through history. I'm talking 1800s, 1700s, 1600s, back when only midwives attended births. Male doctors didn't attend births until 19, you know, and change, 1920s or 30s, I believe it was, that it really started to become male OBs started to, quote, deliver. No one delivers your baby, by the way. Deliver <laughs> babies. Your baby is born. <laughs> so there were stories about how, um, the, for whatever reason, the female midwife couldn't make it. And so this male doctor shows up and the woman would, quote, fall out of labor. She would stop. There was one case where a male doctor showed up to help this woman and her labor totally stopped and she didn't go back into labor for a week. And some may say, oh, well, that sounds like it could have just been prod prodromal labor. But it, then it, it also lends the question, I wonder if sometimes women are actually in labor and fall out of labor because they're uncomfortable with the situation and it really isn't prodromal labor. Because think about the scenario with my, quote, prodromal labor and how I was having contractions and then as soon as I got to the hospital, they fell apart. And then the same thing happened the second time. There's something about the hospital that I just don't um, connect with. <laughs> I do think I have a little bit of history with some potentially hospital trauma, hospital fears. I used to race motorcycles. I have broken a number of bones and been to the hospital a number of times. And so when I think about the hospital, I think about pain. I think about injury. I think about times that I've been there because I was getting carted over there because they scraped me off of the ground. So I do think that there might be some of that at play when it came to going there during my birthing time. So anyway, back to the epidural. And oh, wait. You know what? Um, yeah, go ahead. All right. So I was just going to say really quickly about the reverse dilation, right? Mm-hmm. Um, I think a really easy way to think about this is just clamming up. You know, yeah. you could really clam up mm -hmm. very easily. Um, and I don't know if you want to go there on the podcast, if it's like kosher enough for you. But, you know, that story about, you know, what you would do in front of other people. Oh, yeah. So Ina May talks about, she calls it the sphincter law, mm. which there are, people will debate this, whether or not other uh, other orifices are really sphincters or not. So I don't really think that we, we're not going to get into that debate about whether they're, they are considered sphincters or Doesn't not. Matter. But it, the same idea applies. If you were to go on a stage in front of a hundred people, anybody, 10 people, anybody, any, anybody really. and they said, okay, now go to the bathroom in front of all of us on stage. Could you do it? Probably going to clam up. And it's the same thing with birth. <laughs> and it's the same thing with birth. I mean, if you think about it, you are exposing yourself, your whole self, to people that you don't know. When I, I, I forgot to mention the doctor that we had been going to here in Tennessee. When I went to my last appointment with her when I was 39 weeks and one day. About to blow ready to go after she swept my membranes mm. no mind mind you which i begged you not to do i know i know i made a lot of mistakes mm. <laughs> haven't we all <laughs> i found out she was going on a 10-day cruise and she was leaving the next day so she wasn't <laughs> even going to be there on my quote you know uh due date after she swept your membranes which everyone knows could push you along quicker. it could it could you could go into labor day you know hours mm -hmm. after that 30 minutes after that so it's like giving you a boost and then oh, by the way there. i'm gonna be gone by right. the way i'm gonna be gone she actually but i'll give you a c-section or i'll induce you the minute i come back she did she scheduled me for an induction the, the day, day she, she came, came back, back. Mm -hmm. it'll be the first thing i do if you haven't had the baby by then we'll get that baby out because i need to be there <laughs> once my cruise is over <laughs> yeah exactly and for those of you that aren't familiar with an induction, an induction is when they artificially put you into labor. So think about that. Artificially, there's nothing natural about it. Your body is not going to connect all the wires and all the pieces together. So anyway, so she wasn't there. This means that at the hospital, every single person that was around us was a stranger. Mm. 
the nurses were all strangers. The doctor that was on call was a stranger. I did not know any of these people. And yet here they are asking me to open my legs so that they can stick my hand, their hands up there. I just really think about this for a minute. This is crazy. I know that we are programmed for this from the time that we were young girls to go to the go to the OB, go to the gynecologist and get exams and they're priming us for this throughout our young woman, women woman lives. But it is just not okay. Uh, honestly, I really, the, the most birth trauma that I experienced from this came from this doctor that I did not know showing up when I finally got to the point where they, so they, um, came in, they said I was an eight and then they came back 20 minutes later, said it's time to push. I'm like interesting because I don't feel anything. They had me start pushing and this doctor only came in every, you know, once in a while. And when she would come in, she would stick her hand in there and swoop her hand around the baby's head. And that feeling stuck with me. It haunted me for Mm. a really long time. It was something I cried about. I had nightmares about it. It really, it traumatized me. And I know that she probably does that to everybody But that isn't something that um, I ever expected. And I don't even really know what more to say about it. I have something I can say about it. Not only did you feel that uncomfortable and that you really... It was violating. It was so violating for you. That was also the reason why she said that you needed a C-section. Was because she stuck her hand in Mm. there so many times that you were liable to get an infection. That's right. So I was pushing on my back with an epidural for about three hours or so. And she did come in and say, now, mind you, this is, we started this 10 something at night. So by this time it's, you know, two o'clock in the morning. My analysis of this is she's getting sick of this. You know, she wanted to move on and maybe her shift was going to end. I have no idea, but she comes in and says, all right, you know, you've been pushing too, for a long time. I've stuck my hand in there too many times. You're at risk for infection. And she cleared the room. So all the nurses were gone. Everybody was gone. It was just us. And I start bawling. I'm like, I don't want a C-section. He's like, are you kidding? It's only been three hours. <laughs> it's only been three hours. Come on, let's keep pushing. I've heard of people going being in labor for 24 hours, you know, yeah. being in labor forever. This had just started and it just felt so premature. And it it felt that premature because I felt like we went from zero to pushing so quickly Mm -hmm. and then didn't get that far. But we saw the top of the baby's head. Yeah, you could see her head. You could see her head. And then it felt like, all right, we're just not going to do this anymore because it's been three hours. But really, I just felt like we needed to just like take a break. Like Mm -hmm. we needed to just... How about we Back just off. press pause? Yeah. You know, you guys are trying to force it so much. You already pushed Pitocin when we didn't want that to happen. It yeah. was like thing, they tried to push things so quickly. And then it was like, oh, listen, we need to just cut this baby out of your belly. Mm-hmm. So a couple of things I should throw out there. Like Mike said, I had in my birth plan no Pitocin. And they did push Pitocin. And I only knew because I could feel it. Even with the epidural, I started to feel a lot of pain. She was like, what is going on? And I said, what is happening? And they said, they did it without my consent. They, I'm sure whatever I signed, you know, said that they could do that. And they said, oh, well, your contractions were falling apart. We wanted to make them closer together. They also said, oh, after two and a half hours of pushing, oh, the baby's posterior and asynclitic, which means that her head was a little bit sideways and she was not. They actually didn't say posterior. They said she's sunny side up, but that's what posterior is. So she wasn't in an optimal position and things were not any better with me being on my back. So they finally found this seasoned nurse who knew spinning baby. She came in, tried one or two things. And then that's when the doctor came in and said, let's cut the baby out. And um, I felt defeated And I felt like I had to listen to the doctor. I felt like she was 
you know, she was the one I had to listen to. She knew best. I needed to do what she told me to do. And so I did. I just remember being on that gurney on the way into the operating room pushing. And they <laughs> so I was like, stop pushing. Are you pushing? And I really was just like, come on, come on, baby, come out. I wanted her to come out so I didn't have to go through that experience. So what happened next was wild. And anybody who's had a C-section already has been down this road. They strap you down like you're on a cross. Your arms are out um, by your sides. They strap your wrists down. They pump you up with all of these drugs. And then they, you know, cut your baby out. And when they went to take Brooke out, she was so far into my pelvis because she was literally about to be born that the doctor had to dig her out. And what happened was because you know they cut an incision across to get in there because she had to root around in there a bit I have what's called hysterotomy extensions and that's where where the incision is tears up or down different for every person and they you know they sew them back up but some people will say that there is an additional risk for uterine rupture in the future with future births so that happened but then the doctor also cut my bladder everything was moved around and so my my bladder was damaged during that experience Brooke was born they didn't tell us any of this stuff and when Brooke was they did bring Brooke to me to nurse her which I really appreciated because things did not go the way that we had planned you know we wanted to have that golden hour and delayed cord clamping and all of the crunchy things and instead (laughs) here we were in the operating room Mm. and so mike knew something was up because i mean i'll let you tell because i was pretty out of it yeah i mean i'll say this first the happy note is that i'll never forget the moment when i saw brooke when they you know picked her up and that first moment when I saw mm. my baby and I was just like, oh my God, you know, I never, <laughs> you never dream, you never expect what your baby's going to look like. You see mm. a little ultrasound, you see a little bean in there <laughs> and then you see some arms and legs, but you're only seeing and you know, anybody who's seen an ultrasound, you're really looking at a blob. <laughs> but then that moment when I saw my baby was just the most incredible mm. life-changing moment. And the moment that I touched her skin, you know, she's she's laying there and I like got to feel her skin. Mm. You know, that was just a miracle and just absolutely amazing. Um, so that's the beautiful and the wonderful part. And then I got to hold her and, you know, wait for this surgery to end. Um, and so I'm holding her and I kind of go back to your side and you know, show you the baby and, you know, we're together and just kind of waiting around, you know, not really knowing what was going to happen next or what was supposed to happen or, you know, how to let's wrap this up. You know, what are we going to do? Where does this go from here? Um, and it's just kind of taken a while and we're just waiting around a little bit. And it was one of those things where you kind of know that something's up you know, you, no one's saying anything to me, um, but everyone's kind of like whispering to each other. And there's like a real tension in the room that you could cut with a knife. And, you know, eventually I realized that there was a problem Mm. and didn't really know what the problem was. But knowing that I was in a surgery room at 2 a.m. and it's bright white lights and there's 10 people in the room, a dozen people in the room, um, and me and my wife and my baby, you know, I'm there watching this happen and knowing that there's a problem, but knowing that I need to keep my cool. Mm. Because if I start to, you know, do anything, if I start getting excited at all, they're probably just going to like walk me out. Mm -hmm. And I knew that that would probably happen. So I'm just like keeping my cool. And the other thing that I was telling myself, honestly, is that there's nothing I can do to help. 
you know <laughs> you can't get back there behind yeah, the curtain like I'm, <laughs> there's nothing that i can do to step in and like sure. assist so i knew that i needed to to really like put my trust in these people mm. that they were going to help you um and that's you know that's something really important like we're gonna f- tell you a lot of our experiences and and things that we've seen and gone through um but as a disclaimer you know we're not giving medical advice and there are certainly modern miracles that science has figured out of how to do this and how to do things and save people too um and that was this was one of those moments where we needed to trust i needed to trust the system well you needed to trust them to fix kind of fix a problem (laughs) that they might have created but at, at any rate i mean we were down that road. We, we were, were down already road. down the. Yeah. We were already down the hole. They had. Yeah. They had to. Re- I mean, I, what else was I going to do? You know. Yeah. So that was pretty crazy because I don't know if you guys know this, but when they do a C-section, they take everything out, so your uterus is out. Which was wild. Which is crazy. <laughs> it's outside of your body. On they like, they lay it on your stomach. So because they cut my bladder. The urologist on call wasn't comfortable because of the way that it was cut. It was like a hook. And some OBs will actually sew bladder injuries because they're used to doing this. This is fairly common, I have learned. But they didn't feel confident doing it. So they wanted to call in this special guy that's been doing it for a long time. He was nervous. The guy was nervous. (laughs) Like, first of all, we needed to wait. You know, it's 2 a.m., right? There maybe there's somebody on call, but they're somewhere else in the hospital or wherever. They he was are. at home sleeping. What do you mean? No, that was the the next guy. Oh, that you was mean like the, on the backup call guy. guy. Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah. That was the backup. Um, and like I just remember when this when the younger guy came in, he kind of took a look and was like, "Oh, there, I'm not touching that. Like, there's nothing I could do about that." And like, think of me. Like, my wife is cut <laughs> open on a table, and this guy's like, "I can't touch this. I'm not." I can't deal with that. <laughs> you know, and this is the guy that they called. Like the, the doctor who made the incision didn't feel comfortable, called the specialist. The specialist didn't feel comfortable. And now they're calling in finally this like seasoned urologist. And we waited for hours, literally Three hours. for hours. And it didn't, I don't, I was in a time zone warp. Like I didn't know what was going on. I'm in this room again, this white room holding my newborn baby. My wife is like on drugs on a table. <laughs> her guts are are out, uh, laying on her stomach. I don't know. She said that they take the uterus out. I don't know if they normally do that. But she had her uterus and multiple organs, like her intestines and stuff. And I'm like looking over the sheet. She can't see it because they put a sheet to block you. They block the, the mom. And I'm looking at her her body cut open. And like, they were like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Like when I went to stand up, cause normally you're sitting ne- and I'm just sitting next yeah, to you. Yeah, you were sitting next to me. And eventually we were waiting so long. And this is when I started catching on, something was up. I like started to stand up to like, look at what was going on. And they were like, everyone was like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Like you, are you sure that you want to look at this? Cause we've had people pass out in the operating room. You're holding your baby. <laughs> and I was like, yeah, I'll be all right. And I stand up and I look and I was like, oh, okay. I see why people could pass out. But, but again, like I'm just like keeping my cool as much as possible. Yeah. And so this guy shows this up, guy this guy finally shows fa- up, shows up and, and then what happens? And, and shows up and like, no, no, no. What happens when he comes in? Oh, so <laughs> he comes in and this is the day before New Year's Eve or technically it's, it's the wee hours of New Year's Eve morning. So it's yes. December 31st, 3 a.m. Yes. So right before New Year's Eve. It was and more like 5 a.m. at this point, I think. This guy comes in and he's like, oh, guys, I am just, I was just so tired. I couldn't get out of bed today. I just can't believe it. I'm so sorry to keep you all waiting here. I just couldn't get out of bed. And again, like it's me, my wife, and my newborn baby in there. And everybody else is a doctor and medical staff. So they're all like, yeah, you know, we understand. And I'm just there like, are you kidding me, guy? Like, <laughs> you could have made a little more effort or at least like talk about that in the break room. Yeah, like, not in you front just, of your like, patients. You came in in front of your patients. It was just, oh my. It was crazy. Oh my. Yeah. Oh. So he sewed me up, uh, or he sewed up the bladder and they couldn't sew up the rest of the stuff until he did his job. Mm-hmm. 
So at some point you left, they sewed up the bladder, they sewed up the uterus, they put everything back in first before they sewed it up. And then I also had a cervical tear that she had to sew Mm. after all of this stuff. And I was paranoid because I was still on all these drugs that I thought she was putting an IUD in there. And so I was freaking out about that. This was my own fear. And yeah, I lost so much blood. I had to have three blood transfusions after this because I had hemorrhaged and obviously was, you know, things did not go well. I had a catheter that I had to leave in for a couple of weeks until my bladder was healed. And my husband's gone. My baby's gone. I'm in here for hours longer getting sewn up. I finally get out of this room. They moved me to this other room where they did the transfusion. And I'm just like, where's my baby? Where's my baby? And my Mike was in the room. And as soon as I got in there, I'm like, where's the baby? Where's the baby? Because he didn't have her. And I had told him, like, don't leave the baby. You know, make sure that you keep her with you at all times. I was nervous about them potentially administering something without our consent. But I could see it in his eyes. He was so tired. He, he was... you were like in a a different you talked about the time warp it was like you were not even alive in some ways Mm -hmm. it was such a crazy night so we uh didn't have the baby for a while and they kept saying they were going to bring her to us and then it wasn't until they moved us out of that room i believe that they finally did and then after that i was like no you're not ever taking her ever again Mm -hmm. so i didn't know that i they injured I'm using their words. I, I didn't know that they cut my bladder until days later. I thought that it was my fault. I thought it happened during pushing because I was pushing so hard or something. She told everyone that she blew her bladder out. Yeah, because they told what I was told was that I had experienced a bladder injury during childbirth. That's what they said. She was on the phone with her mom. Yeah, I was pushing so hard I blew my bladder out. And yeah. Until we finally found out. One of the nurses heard me saying that, and she's like, "You, you didn't you blow didn't your bladder blow out. Blow your bladder out. You didn't do this. They cut it when they were doing your C-section." And I was like, "What?" So, so they really presented. They presented it in a very, uh, what is the word? I would say legalistic way to mm. try to defend themselves and and not have liability is the way that they. Yeah. You know, they basically lied to us and made it seem like something that it wasn't true. And I should have known because they were vi- they were sending a lot of doctors in to check on me. There's a lot of people checking up. It just, it definitely seemed a little bit suspicious. They I'd did say. send a ton of doctors Tons. in. They were like a bunch of people. I saw like, basically every up? OB that worked in that hospital. It's, yeah, it feels like a lot of urologists. Of I mean, there was always, I was so used to random people walking into that room. Because they were sending so many And people. being real nice. Like nicer than you normally get <laughs> treatment. You know? Totally. So then the other event that happened was that second dose of Rogam. I had an anaphylactic reaction to it. I do carry my own EpiPen because I am highly allergic to Red 4, which is also called Carmine, which is made of crushed bugs. If you follow me on Instagram, you probably know this because I've posted it about it, posted about it there before. And this was a whole journey I went on to figure out this allergy. So I carry that EpiPen with me and... When this happened, they were like, you have an EpiPen? We, let's use yours because we can get to you faster than, than finding one in the hospital. Very interesting. So anyway, I went through that whole thing and got out, went home. I had this uh, recovery from surgery, this catheter that I had to carry with me and empty out and deal with a newborn baby. Um, I will say that none of this impacted my ability to bond with my daughter, Mm. our daughter, though I was just so grateful to have her. She was just so beautiful and such a gift. But this left some scars that took a long time to heal. I remember going to my follow-up appointment six weeks after or whenever that was. Yeah, I think it was six weeks to the original OB and I told her what happened And I was crying and I was just so, you know, traumatized. And she (laughs) literally said to me, okay, well, you don't need to cry about it. At least your, your baby was born and everything's fine. She was so dead inside. It was, (laughs) it was very cold Mm. and very just not loving. And anyway, it was a rough time. Thank you. (laughs) 
So let's fast forward. We had this experience Take and two. you would think that it would deter us from having another baby. And I would say for you, it kind of did for a little while. Oh, I was scared straight. He used to say to people, I don't want to go through that again. And I'd be no. like, you don't want to go through this again. What about what I went no. through? And I know that your trauma was physical and mental. Um, and no one could know what it was like better than me because I was there. Mm -hmm. But it definitely took a, it had an impact on me too, you yeah. know, to see you like that not knowing what was even going to happen. Like, yeah. I didn't know if we were going to make it out of there. Yeah. I didn't know if I was going to see you again. Like, it was that bad. Like, there was a, you had, you mentioned you had to get a blood transfusion. Um, you lost so much blood. You had to get multiple pints of blood. Mm -hmm. And you also, like, I saw the wall of, they basically, the, um, there were, like, pouches with gauze pads and it was like a wall of them because that's what they use to like absorb the blood mm -hmm. and that's how they count mm. the amount of blood that you lost mm. and there's also like a suction thing that it goes into a container and so you could see like the liter of blood that was in there and then plus the absorbed pads like it was it was really scary like yeah yeah it was really scary it was. And one of the other things that I had to deal with was that I actually physically didn't feel the same after this. I said to Mike, I felt like they put my organs in wrong. <laughs> I, I really did because my stomach never felt the same after that. It felt like everything was higher in my stomach as if they just crammed everything back in there out of order, which felt really weird. And so I don't know if they they did or not or if that was just a result of everything being swollen for a longer time but that first year was definitely hard physically to adjust to having my whole body feel different having the scar having to heal from this having to go through it it was hard but i i knew that we were going to have more children i just i you know god laid that on my heart and i also trusted in him and this was a time where I did seek the Lord for healing from this because I needed it. I needed him in this time to teach me how to forgive and to teach me how to move on from this. Thank you so much for joining us for today's episode on spiritual birth with my husband, Mike Toomey. We will be back next week to talk about the remainder of the story and what happened next. So you won't want to miss that because we are talking about the power of the Lord and that's the very best part. I do want to give a quick reminder that we mentioned a couple of things during this episode, a couple of books, uh, some beef liver capsules, things of that nature, dandelion root, whatnot. All of the things that we mentioned in these episodes, I am very diligent to add to the show notes with some links just to make it easy for you later down the road so you don't have to write something down and try to look it up. So please do visit our website at theradiantmission.com. If you visit the blog, so radiantmission.com forward slash blog, or just click on the, the link there, you can find the blog for every single episode of this podcast. And in those show notes, these things are listed. So be sure to check that out. If you want a click, quick link, if you heard something and you wanted to get to it quickly, but today I would like to end with a Bible verse that really touched me during the healing process of my C-section post, post Brooke, and it's on forgiveness. And it is from Matthew 6 verses 14 and 15. For if you forgive other people when they sin against you, your heavenly father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their sins, your father will not forgive your sins. That was so powerful to me during just this really difficult time and encouraging me to forgive and how important it is to extend forgiveness. So I just wanted to share that. And we are wishing you a radiant week. We'll see you next time.